watching it, and welcome to Madison Church. I want to begin this morning with an apology for the condition of your car after having driven here on 350th Avenue. Maybe someday we'll issue car wash tokens, uh, but that day is not today. Uh, we have some announcements that are in your bulletin and some more announcements that I'd like to highlight. Uh, the first is that we're going to have a very brief nativity practice after church. And so th this is part of the Brooklyn Christmas Traditions uh, weekend uh, or Saturday. Uh, that is this Saturday. And we're going to be doing a live read of the nativity, uh, the Christmas story that is acted out. And uh, in Brooklyn, they'll have a tree lighting at 6 o'clock outside Brooklyn Community Estates. And right after they light up the tree... Uh, that's when we'll go. And so we'll read the Christmas story and we'll act it out so people get to see it. And uh, if, so if you signed up to help with that, please go downstairs to the big classroom. And this is not going to take more than 15 minutes. And uh, so we'll run through that. Uh, if you're not helping out, we would love for you guys to go. And uh, it'd be a great way. You can invite people. And it, it, if you have kids, it's a great way to expose them to the Christmas story and let them see it. It's a great way for you, if you're not a kid, to think about and celebrate uh, Jesus, the arrival of Jesus on Christmas and during the Christmas season. So, so come out uh, to the tree lighting. We're going to start right after they light the tree at 6 o'clock at Brooklyn Community Estates. Uh, also, next Saturday on that same day, there are a couple things going on. Uh, Center Youth Group is having a lunch fundraiser in the school during the kind of business expo that's going on around lunchtime. So if you wanted to stop by the elementary cafeteria, uh, Center Youth Group will be serving uh, loaded baked potatoes over there, a baked potato bar. And uh, also, uh, Charlie and Holly Losh would like some help moving on Saturday. And so if you have some time, uh, or packing up stuff, packing up stuff. And so uh, if you have some time on Saturday and are able to help, uh, we'll head out to the Loshes and I can, I can help you find their place, I guess. We have... Uh, I can get you a directory, and uh, we'll get you their address. But they could use some help uh, next Saturday packing up. Uh, next Sunday, which is the next day, on December 8th, uh, we're going to go caroling. And so this is a really fun time for me. I love it. We're going to have a group in Grinnell that will go to the Mayflower and to St. Francis and some other places in Grinnell. And then we'll have a group that carols in Brooklyn at the same time uh, that will actually start a little later, and they will meet at Brookhaven. So the Grinnell group will meet at 5 o'clock at Mayflower there in the lobby. And uh, the uh, Brooklyn group will meet at 6 o'clock in the lobby at Brooklyn Community Estates. And we'll do caroling, and then we'll all come back here to the church for a Christmas party that should start around 7. And uh, so if you can't carol with us or you don't want to carol, uh, the idea of walking um, around a nursing home singing carols terrifies you, you can just come to the Christmas party at 7 o'clock and we'll have, a, we'll have a wonderful time there. December 22nd is our Christmas program uh, at Madison Church and our kids are busy in the Sunday school hour preparing for that. So we would love for your kids to be a part of our Christmas program and bring them to Sunday school and we'll, we'll practice and get ready for that. On the morning, uh, during the church service on December 22nd. Uh, and also I just want to highlight the fact that in the year 2020, Madison Church is going to do a Bible reading plan together where we read through the entire gospel story, okay? From the introductory statement about Jesus in John chapter 1 all the way to the ascension of Jesus in, in Acts chapter 1. And we'll cover all the material in the gospel in one chronological story, and it is a reading plan that only requires about 50 verses a week. It's perfect for anybody. If you're, maybe you're not used to reading your Bible regularly or this would be your first time with a Bible reading plan, this is perfect for you. Uh, you'll be able to go at your own pace and be reflective about what we're reading and it's something that I would like all of us to do together. Uh, so this week, we'll be pushing out some material about if you want to join us in a reading plan about how to select a Bible to read Maybe uh, you have somebody who needs a Bible for a Christmas gift, or you're thinking, I could use a new one. Well, we have a, a helpful article that just posted on our website, and we'll have paper copies out next week uh, that we'll be sharing about how to pick a good Bible to read along with us. And I just want to really encourage you to think about maybe making this a resolution or a commitment that you make in 2020 to join us in our gospel and your reading plan. 
And now we're going to go to a time of prayer. If I could just add one thing. Um, next Sunday, we will be making cheer baskets, if I'm correct. Renee, I'm looking at you. Cheer baskets after church, what they are, they are plates of goodies that we give to elderly widows in our church um, and in the community. So if you would be willing to bring two dozen goodies um, next Sunday after church, we'll make those in the downstairs, and then we'll deliver them that day. This is now <clears throat> December, and we are getting ready for Christmas, but I still want to talk about Thanksgiving. As we, uh, as we come to prayer time this morning, uh, I'm just going to start, I'll start praying, but I want to share with you these words as I lead into it. This is a Thanksgiving Day proclamation from Governor John Hancock of Massachusetts in 1791. In consideration of the many undeserved blessings conferred upon us by God, the Father of all mercies, it becomes us not only in our private and usual devotion to express our obligations to him, as well as our dependence upon him, but also specially to set apart a day to be employed for this great and important purpose. I have therefore thought fit to appoint and by the advice and consent of the council, do hereby accordingly appoint Thursday, the 17th of November next, to be observed as a day of public thanksgiving and praise through this commonwealth, throughout this commonwealth. Hereby calling upon ministers and people of every denomination to assemble on the said day, and in the name of the great mediator, devoutly and sincerely offer to Almighty God the gratitude of our hearts for all his goodness towards us, more especially in that he has been pleased to continue to us so great a measure of health, to cause the earth plentifully to yield her increase, so that we are supplied with the necessaries and the comforts of life, to prosper our merchandise and fishery, and above all, not only to continue to us the enjoyment of our civil rights and liberties, but the great and most important blessing, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And together with our cordial acknowledgments, I do earnestly recommend that we may join the penitent confession of our sins and employ the further continuance of that divine protection and blessings of heaven upon this people, especially that he would be graciously pleased to direct and prosper the administration of the federal government and of this and the other states in the Union, to afford him further smiles on our agriculture and fisheries, commerce and manufactures, to prosper our university and all seminaries of learning, to bless the virtuously struggling for the rights of men so that universal happiness may be allies of the United States, and to afford his almighty aid to all people who are established in the world, that all may bow to the scepter of our Lord Jesus Christ and the whole earth be filled with his glory. Let's pray. Father, you give us so many blessings that are undeserved. Everything you give us is undeserved. God, I know there are some of us who are struggling, who have health issues, have family issues. But God, you are so much greater than all those things. And just focusing on you helps to carry us through those times of trouble. God, you've blessed our nation so much more than we deserve. God, we ask for repentance for our leaders, for people of our nation, that people would come back to you. God, I ask that we would be honest with our sin before you today. That you would take our sin away from us. And God, we thank you for the most important thing, the gospel of your son, the good news that we could be made right with you. God, we ask that you're with us now. May you be honored and blessed in our time and worship of you. In Jesus' name, amen.
It's exciting today to start the celebration of our Advent. Would you stand as we begin to sing?
In Jesus Christ, we are given new life. That's why Christmas is such a happy occasion. It's what he came to offer each of us. A chance to discard that old picture and our enslavement to those old things and be born again. Life in Jesus Christ is different than life without him. It has to be. If you find that your life in Jesus, if the new picture you are given is not that much different than the old one, then you need to examine whether or not you have died your life of sin and began a new one in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus didn't come to this earth and die on the cross so that you could get dunked in a tank of water and go back to life as usual. Jesus didn't suffer the whip and bear the cross while being mocked for just an hour of your life on Sunday mornings. Our God and Father did not send his son to this fate so that we could simply feel better about the afterlife and say encouraging words at funerals. God sent, his wor- God sent his son to this world as the culmination of a plan that had been in the works for about 2,000 years. It was his plan to confront and defeat the sin, wickedness, and evil that we had brought to this world and to do so through the only sacrifice that could atone for all of it. God did it. God sent his son to turn the world as we know it upside down. To strip authority away from the powers that enslaved mankind. To being creatures of greed and falsehood and selfishness. He stripped those powers of their authority and he gave all of that power to the one true king, Jesus Christ. The Messiah and our Lord. It is he, it is Jesus, who humbled himself to become our servant through his death. It is Jesus who robbed the powers of this world of their authority on the cross. It is Jesus who conquered the curse of death for us when he rose on Easter morning. Only Jesus is worthy to approach the Ancient of Days and be given authority and dominion and a kingdom that will never end. Jesus has ascended into heaven and he has done just that. As he declares to his disciples, uh, the last time he appeared to them in Matthew 28, he tells them, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. You understand that? Now, at this moment, our Lord Jesus reigns from on high over the unstoppable kingdom which bears his name and the power of God's spirit. That is the church. So now, when we become a Christian, we're not simply washing away our personal guilt or clearing our conscience or we're not just taking a number for the waiting line to an eternal paradise. That's the way it's treated in our world too often and it's a sham. If you've ever gotten that impression from me that that is what faith is, I owe you an apology and I'll need to answer for my careless words on the day of judgment. Becoming a Christian means making this Jesus, the one that arrived on Christmas and was crucified on Good Friday and rose from the dead on Easter morning, it means making this Jesus the Lord of your life. Making Jesus Lord, in in the plainest English I can provide, means making Jesus the boss giving him the say-so, ceding to his authority, his reign, his lordship. Making Jesus your Lord means joining the kingdom of his people who are submitting to his authority and living their lives to fulfill his mission. That's what it means. 
And so here is the crux of the matter. We, of our own nature and in our own world, our hearts and minds are bent towards wickedness and selfishness. We are born to sin. We have been trained to ignore the righteousness of God. But when we make Christ our Lord and become obedient to his imperative commands that we confess our faith, repent our sins, and are baptized, we receive the Holy Spirit so that for the very purpose that our lives may be changed from the wicked selfishness and poverty in which we used to walk, our old selves in bondage to the old ways and our old sins to the new way of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus through the power of God's Spirit. It is a battle of allegiance. It is not nominal. It requires, it requires the commitment of your life. And that is why our lives have to be different. Any understanding of the Christian faith in which your life, before you have faith in Jesus, before you have this promise of salvation and this hope of heaven, any version of the, of the Christian gospel which you have received that doesn't include your life changing when you make Jesus your Lord was not true. Together, we've been going through Galatians, and that is a book of the Bible which was written to people who needed to be taught what life on this side of faith should look like. They were, they were being misled by false teachers who were telling them that after they believed in Jesus, they needed to follow the commands of the Old Testament, including commands to not walk a certain distance on the Sabbath, commands to be circumcised, all the males, commands to uh, observe certain eating regulations. They were being misled by people who told them that this is what life in Christ should look like. This is what life looks like on this side of faith. So God's word through the Apostle Paul tells them these three crucial truths while controverting that false teaching. These three truths, that we have new life in Jesus Christ. That when we become a Christian, we die to our life of sin and we get a new one, right? You get a new picture with new rules, that we've been set free from law and sin. And this is not a freedom to pick, to pick any life you choose and have it be underwritten by God. This is a freedom to be freed from the bonds of sin which had enslaved us and be restored to the people that God made us to be. It is a freedom to be who we were made to be, who we truly are. Then finally, that the Spirit that, of God that we are given and our flesh, our sinful nature, are in conflict. They're in conflict in our own hearts and minds. Then in Galatians 5, we are given two lists which together form a compass for the life of faith. It gives you, gives you a direction to not go and a direction to go in. First, we have the acts of the flesh representing a way of life from which we are to flee because it belongs to the life of sin to which we died. And then we're given the fruits of the Spirit, which we are to walk in because we belong to a new life in Jesus. This is what the Galatian believers needed to know about new life in Jesus, and this is what you need to know about a new life in Jesus Christ. Reject any teacher or influence that tempts you to indulge the fleshly nature the words in red on the screen, the ones you find in Galatians 5. At the same time, as we have, as we have observed throughout, be cautious of those who would wish to burden every believer with a list of rules or commands that come in addition to or in excess of those which are enjoined upon us in God's word. Be careful of those who wish to steal the believer's freedom by piling upon them commands and rules which to obey. That is the very practice which Paul here is repudiating for the Galatian church. But this list is complete. We've gone through every word. Now pay careful attention to what teaching in God's word will follow this construction. The way of New life in, in Jesus Christ has been laid out in the book of Galatians. Paul starts in this book by defending his own apostleship, 
telling them what the gospel means and why they no longer have to be circumcised, and then giving them a positive construction, a positive vision for what life in Jesus should look like. But there's more left to say. There's something else left that the Galatian believers need to know when all of this is said and all of these lists are done. So now we will turn our attention to what needs to be said after the new rules for life in Christ have been established and drawn out as we read on in Galatians 5. I'm going to start reading in verse 22. There we'll see words that are familiar, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. That's all a restatement. So far, after the fruits of the Spirit, we just have a summary. But here is the new material. In verse 26, Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. After Paul has gone to these lengths, after God's Word has gone to these lengths to describe for us what life must be in Christ, And what kinds of things describe the old life, the way of sin, and what kinds of things describe the new life, the way of the Spirit? What's left to say as we approach the end of the book of Galatians is that we need to do this new life together. Is this new life on this side of faith is to be done together with our brothers and sisters in the faith. It is not to be done in such a way that provokes or envies our brothers and sisters in the faith. But as we read on in Galatians, we will see that quite the opposite is to take place. Reading on in Galatians, starting in verse 1 of chapter 6. There we read, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should, re- should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Now, you need to see what's going on here. Remember, the Galatian church was being misled. They were being taught by false teachers that they should obey the law, God's law, the Mosaic law. Don't walk a mile on Saturday. Don't eat lobster. Uh, Every male must be circumcised on the eighth day. These are part of the law which they were being misled to believe, the Mosaic law. And throughout Galatians, Paul is telling them not to obey the law, that they are not saved by the law. So here in Galatians 6, 2, we learn about a new law, a new way. It is not, what, not the fruits of the Spirit which was listed before, but this new law, the law of Christ, is to carry each other's burdens. It's not only a matter of what we resolve to do in our hearts or in our minds, in obedience to God's Spirit and uh, in rejecting the old way, the way of sin and the way of death, but the law of Christ is about how we do it together about how we support and love one another as Christ's body, the church on this side of faith. The fellowship of faithful believers is provided for us by God so that we can encourage one another and so that we can carry each other's burdens. It is an essential, indispensable part of the new life in Christ. We are to do it together. And to the extent that we embrace this teaching, to the extent that we do not envy or provoke each other, to the extent which we do carry each other's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ, we will succeed. And to the extent which we do not do it together, to the extent to which we try to live a life of righteousness on our own, Away from the fellowship and support that God has made for us in the church, we will likely fail. After God's word tells us how to live, 
tells us the right things to do and the wrong things to do so that it's clear for us. The next thing it teaches us in God's Word is that we're supposed to do it together. There are a number of opportunities we have at Madison Church to do this together. That's why we meet as a church. That's why we exist as a body is so that we can pursue this new life in Jesus Christ together. Every time you attend a church service, your attendance is a gift of fellowship to your brothers and sisters in the faith at your church. Your willingness to get up and put on sometimes church clothes. You come in jeans, that's fine. It's fine, Larry. When you get up on Sunday morning and you resolve, you decide, I'm going to come to church today. That is a gift you are giving your brothers and sisters in Christ, a gift of presence, a gift of fellowship, a willingness to say that you will stand next to them and sing praises to Christ your Savior together. When you come to Sunday school at church, you are giving a gift of fellowship to your brother and sister in Christ because you are able to talk with them then in a more open forum, though you can talk with me now, and Craig does so sometimes when I'm up here. And I encourage that. More, than, more people than Craig are welcome to. But when you come to Sunday school, you can talk to Craig even more about what God's Word says. It's an opportunity we have to share with each other about what we have read there and what it means for our lives. Next year, we're doing a reading plan together at church, and it's an opportunity you have to carry each other's burdens, to encourage one another by reading the same Bible passages as they are for a time, and being able to talk with them about what you have read and encourage each other with the message you have received from God's Word. At Madison Church, there are small group Bible studies that meet throughout the week, sometimes weekly, sometimes monthly, sometimes less often than that. But there are groups that exist to offer fellowship, to carry one another's burdens, to develop friendships. When you attend church activities at Madison, you are offering your fellowship, you are part of this command to live a life of faith together. We often have volunteer needs at Madison Church. We have things we ask you to sign up for and help with. That's because Madison Church has a mission, the mission that Christ gave his disciples in Matthew 28 when he said, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me to go and make disciples and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. When you sign up to volunteer at Madison Church or when you help, you're helping to carry one another's burden as the burden of the gospel is what we share as a church. Those are all official, structured church activities. Those are all things we do together that we put on the calendar. But your fellowship is not limited to those events. Whatever you do for the purpose of fellowship of the believers in Jesus Christ is a service of fellowship to the church. When you show up to help somebody out. When you show up at the Loshes on Saturday to help them move, you're helping to carry one another's burden. You are fulfilling the command that we receive in Galatians to not just live a life of the Spirit and die to our life of sin, but to do it together. When you invite over another believer, a brother or sister, or a family, for a meal, or you share time together with them, you're practicing fellowship. You're encouraging one another as we were commanded to do in God's word. This is how we will succeed. The practice of living our life together on this side of faith together is how we will be able to make it happen. Without these things, 
without each other, we will likely fail. And that's not because our Lord and Savior isn't powerful enough or, uh, or isn't strong enough or can't provide for our needs if we're alone, but it's because we will have been unfaithful to his command that we should love and encourage each other. We must bear each other's burdens. As we close this morning, I'd like for us to read a passage from Romans 15, starting in verse 1. This is a passage that's printed on your bulletin. I'd like you to, to follow along as I read it silently. As I, as I read this passage, just follow along either in your Bible or, or in your bulletin. Probably your bulletin because I haven't given you very much time to look it up. But this is a good passage for us to think about and consider as we examine how to live our lives together. How to practice the fellowship of carrying one another's burdens so that we can walk in the Spirit and keep in step as we read in Galatians 5. These words will conclude our reflection on living like you mean it from Romans 15. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good, to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to each, I'm sorry, it was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Jesus Christ had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of the fellowship of these brothers and sisters in Christ that you have given. Thank you for the encouragement they are to me to walk in the Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray that you will fill our hearts with a commitment to lift one another up, to carry each other's burdens, and not to envy or provoke but for us to all keep in step with the Spirit together. Dear God, give us the fellowship of heart and mind that will make us one. One body here to fulfill the mission of your Son, Jesus Christ, as we bear his name. Pray this in your name. Amen. Would you stand as we close?